My first exposure to the shortcomings of OBD2 and factory onboard diagnostics was when we bought our 2005 Ram diesel Cummins truck in October of 2004. At less than 800 miles, the engine started shaking and was obviously dropping cylinders. We knew we had an injection problem of sorts and went back to the dealership under warranty. The engine was throwing a number one cylinder misfire code and the technician, Eric Benson, knew that that might be the problem and then again it might not be. According to warranty procedure, he was required to remove the number one injector and replace it. That made no difference whatsoever, and the next move was to swap injectors around, run a ground test with a lamp, and perform various other chores to prove, in fact, that the problem was not a number one cylinder misfire. Several other cylinders were showing up with misfire codes. Eric is among the best Cummins techs in the United States. He was absolutely convinced that the ECU, or ECM, was defective. Chrysler technicians and engineers, however, argued that were there a problem with the ECU or ECM, the system would interrogate itself and say that that was the problem. We had purchased our truck brand new with zero miles on it, and now at 800 miles, we had this problem. Driving around in a PT Cruiser dealership loan vehicle was hardly a substitute for a Ram 3500 quad cab 4x4. By the time Eric finally got authorization from Chrysler to change the ECU, 25 other vehicles like ours were stuck in dealerships in our zone all the way to Colorado. Cummins furnished a reconditioned ECM unit. Not only did the truck run right at that point, we're still running at 186,000 miles on that same unit. After many years and thousands of customers later, Chrysler eventually extended the warranty on the ECM units in these Gen 3 trucks. Consumers paid thousands of dollars for unnecessary repairs that never solved the problem. The computer itself was at fault, and no scan tool at that time would have said so. Over the years, I've watched consumers pay a small fortune around number one cylinder misfires on Jeep 4-liter engines. There are many other gasoline engines that throw the number one misfire code and end up with crankshaft position sensor, fuel injector, and other parts replacement that has absolutely no bearing on the problem. Parts houses can stay in business on just the sale of coil-on plug coils. In fairness, high-end scan tools can delineate problems beyond a simple number one cylinder P0301 code that points to X number of parts that might need replacing. Unfortunately, it's the consumer who can't afford the high-end scan tool who relies on a code reader and rushes off to the parts house to get the number of parts that are listed under the chart for that code. The money spent needlessly on parts that don't solve the problem could pay for an Autel Maxiscope. Codes are based on PIDs. The parameters are set by the ECM, ECU, or PCM. In many cases, the manufacturer decides how much latitude those PIDs have and how those PIDs will be interpreted. I have been doing diagnostic and troubleshooting work for over half a century. Professionally, I've used every kind of diagnostic tool from a vacuum gauge to a scan tool. In the late 60s and early 70s, I managed a fleet of light and medium duty trucks and introduced the use of an oscilloscope, at that time an Allen machine. I still have a Sun 720 engine analyzer set up for HEI era vehicles and able to do carbon monoxide and hydrocarbon testing at the tailpipe. When I taught at the San Diego Job Corps in the early 1980s, education test equipment included a sun engine analyzer and a sun distributor machine at that time. When classroom instructing at the Rite of Passage program, again adult education level, in the early 2000s, we were starting to use scan tools that were rapidly replacing the old engine analyzers. OBD2 ushered in the era of scan tools. It seemed only logical to use the onboard computer to feed information to a scan tool. Scan tools became more sophisticated and grew in cost as well. 
Today's scan tools can run five to six thousand dollars, and that's just the beginning. There may also be a two thousand dollar a year or more software subscription, including cloud services and technical assistance through the cloud. This may work for a high-end auto dealership where hourly labor rates are passing $150 per hour flat rate. But what about the independent shop, the light truck fleet operation, the smaller business that services their own vehicles, or the serious DIY enthusiast capable of doing their own vehicle maintenance? And while we're at it, who on the Rubicon Trail is going to have a $6,000 scan tool with cloud services where you can't even get cellular phone service? Fortunately, a parallel diagnostic and troubleshooting paradigm has evolved alongside scan tools, and that would be automotive lap scopes and accessories that go with them. Lap scopes in some ways seem old school. They're not concerned about what's going on in the PCM, ECU, or ECM. The concern is what's going on in time intervals and voltage. Now don't get me wrong. The lab scope oscilloscope is just as fast as a PCM, ECU, or ECM. It can analyze in milliseconds, even faster in some cases. So that said, there's nothing lacking in an engine analyzing oscilloscope. What if you could look inside the cylinder of a running engine? What if you could analyze a fuel pump inside the fuel tank? Yes, analyze the condition of the fuel pump without dropping the tank. Wouldn't that be worthwhile before taking a trip over the Rubicon? Who wants to be on the side of the trail dropping their fuel tank when everyone else is having a good time with their 4x4? How is it possible to perform this type of diagnostic without a $6,000 scan tool? The automotive lab scope does two things. It measures voltage and it measures time intervals. Voltage over time creates a wave. That wave signal can be read on a laptop computer or a PC computer or even on a cellular phone or tablet. So what form does that wave signal take? In some cases, it may be the parade of spark firing lines. In other circumstances, it may be a pressure transducer explaining the cylinder pressures through a voltage signal. We learn over time to interpret these signals. Each one is a specific shape, and that shape tells us something about the underlying voltage and time interval. One diagnostic test that's very valuable quick and somewhat easy is a relative compression check. In a relative compression check, we use the starter motor and the load on the starter motor created by the rise of each piston on the compression stroke to tell us, in the form of the wave pattern, if one or more cylinders is pulling less of a load than the others. We call this a relative compression check. A relative compression check can be performed with nothing more than a high amperage amp clamp. The amp clamp is placed on the battery cable to the starter motor and measures the starter motor amperage draw as each piston comes up on its compression stroke. In the process, this time and voltage, if you will, amperage, is measured and shows as waveforms on the oscilloscope. Of course, on a well-worn engine, all of the cylinders might be low and the relative compression differences might even be minor. In the case of any cylinder having a lower reading than the others, however, it is very clear that that cylinder is low on compression. Further checks can be done with a lab scope using a pressure transducer in the cylinder, as in the spark plug hole, or a compression gauge or better yet, a cylinder leak down test. A simpler and less costly pulse pressure sensor can take a reading at the tailpipe in the lower pressure levels and determine that valves, rings, or valve timing is either on or off per cylinder. This is also a quick check for injector function or spark. There are specific lab scope tests that can follow up on any of these quick diagnoses. The pulse pressure sensor has an additional feature. You can check the pressure coming out of the crankcase through the dipstick tube. 
If you're wondering whether the piston rings have blow-by, that will show up in the crankcase. If you use an ignition trigger and put it on number one cylinder, you can determine the firing order, then read the pressure pulses and know which cylinder has piston ring blow-by. All of this with the engine idling and no need to even remove a spark plug. The two significant gains with the lab scope are the quickness by which we can determine engine condition, transmission condition, electrical device condition, and so forth. And secondly, the pinpoint diagnosis that takes place without the use of a scan tool or any other intervention. Of course, high-end scanners now have an interface with automotive lab scopes. The two can work together to pinpoint and accurately diagnose and troubleshoot problems. Of course, like with any other tool, it takes time to get used to using it. The first time you use a lab scope is probably as daunting as the first time I used an engine analyzing machine in 1969. The learning curve can be steep depending upon the equipment and the accessories that you're using. Most importantly, it's necessary to understand what good patterns look like versus patterns that are not good. To know what you're looking at is the biggest challenge with a lab scope. Once you understand what to look for in a pattern, and to be able to set up the equipment to get the patterns you want, the tool can quickly help you troubleshoot and diagnose problems. I attended webinars and did a lot of research before choosing the Autel MaxiScope for my platform. Affordable and full of features, the MaxiScope, once mastered, holds the key to better troubleshooting and diagnostic work. There is a learning curve with any new tool. In the case of the MaxiScope, the objective is to create patterns that are useful for diagnostic work. Two practical and useful first tests would be an in-tank fuel pump tested at the fuse for the fuel pump under the hood. The other test would be a relative compression check using the starter motor and a heavy amp probe. I will demonstrate these tests as part of my series on how to use an automotive lab scope.